Okay, welcome back everyone. The Cube's live coverage here, day one of three days of coverage of Open Source Summit 2023. I'm John Furrier, your host. We got great guests here, here in Vancouver. Rob Streche is analyzing and getting all the notes, bringing down all the action. One of the big conversations we're having is platform engineering, DevOps, software supply chain, and the role of communities as an advantage. As AI comes in, we're going to break down all the open source opportunities. Is it a challenge? Is it an opportunity? We'll see, Diane Mule is here. CUBE alumni, going way back, OG <laughs> for theCUBE, great to have you. Managing Director, Research and Advisory Services, Bitrusiera. Bitergia. Bitergia. Bitergia, the new company name. You left Red Hat, I saw that announcement. Welcome back to theCUBE. Well, it's a pleasure Bitergia. to be here. Bitergia. and Bitergia. Um, welcome to my city. Uh, we turned yeah. on the sunlight for you all. <laughs> um, it was really wonderful <laughs> to have everybody here at Open Source Summit in my yeah. hometown, so I didn't have to go through an airport to get here for a change, well, which is wonderful. Great to see you. Just for the folks watching, you've been a really big part of theCUBE. We've had conversations with, during the OpenStack days, the transition to cloud native with CNCF. At Red Hat, you were involved in OpenShift when it was at a critical juncture, and it kind of, I would, I won't say pivot, because that would make Red Hat roll in their grave, but like, it, they got on the right track and they've been very successful with it. And mm -hmm. congratulations to Red Hat, we thank them for yep. all their support, so thanks Red Hat. But now, you've always been a very community-focused person, you, you understand communities. The role of ecosystems has been a huge discussion point as the industry has completely transformed to open source. It's yep. not just standing on the shoulders of giants, it is all giants now, it's all the industry. The role of the power dynamics are shifting. What is your view right now of how open source is positioned, looking at the future of big wave of open source coming, AI, and then you got security, you got cloud growth. What's your perspective? So, um, I'm glad you said the word ecosystem right off the bat, because I, I really think one of the dynamics that has changed, um, back in the good old days, you could focus on a single individual project and you try and get people, build a community around that, get people to work and contribute to it, and those days are gone. Uh, uh, you know, to paraphrase uh, Steve Ballmer, it's ecosystem, ecosystem, ecosystem. And there's lots of perspectives to it. Um, yeah. From a vendor perspective, it may be everything from the kernel to the container to the cloud in that stack of things. From an enterprise that's using and consuming there, it may be everything in, that's in the supply chain or in the, the SBOM that they've created for their product and figuring out all the things that they consume that's open source and their end users um, and how they in incorporate that into their um, services and things. So it has completely changed my perspective yep. over the, I'd say, the past 10 years of, of working in open source. And I think the reason that that, that perspective change um, is important to recognize and acknowledge is because of the interdependencies of all of these projects on each other. If you look at any of the foundations, and you know, we can talk about big tents at OpenStack and the move to open infra for yeah. days, because we've been there. Um, we watched the CNCF um, bringing in new projects in the sandbox at some exorbitant rates and incubating them and graduating them but they're all interlaced. They have um, release cycles, they have you know, library dependencies, dependencies on each other's resources. Um, and if you don't pay attention to that, um, you're hooped. The other piece of the puzzle I think that's really interesting that you know, we, uh, open source yeah. has won. Right, yeah. we, we, we've yes. won, all right. We, Proprietary we'll says you can't bet against open, that's the yeah. theme here. Yeah. yeah, you just absolutely can't. But I think what we're also seeing is the dynamics about who's participating in open source projects and ecosystems change. Whereas, Explain. Whereas before you'd have large vendors um, benevolently creating open source projects, in, you know, incorporating your feedback and, and creating you know, wonderful things and like Linux and mm -hmm. all the goodness there. Now what you're seeing is projects like backstage, like a Spotify donating that. You're seeing enterprises like Amadeus or BMW or Audi or whomever, they're contributing. When you look at the, the statistics on open source projects and in the ecosystems, you see a lot of names that are not software vendors anymore. And so that changes the dynamics in the community around collaboration. 
So you mean I, end users? And end users, like, yeah. Vir, as we call them sometimes, the virtuous end <laughs> users that like are. Lyft is a good example. Envoy came from Lyft, Uber contributed yep. stuff. So yeah, the it, hyperscaler type. Yeah, yeah and I mean, Meta's contributed stuff as well. Oh, absolutely, I, I, Meta's I, done amazing things. I think the interesting thing was, and going just back a couple weeks to CNCF, when they were talking about that contribution, or contributors were 25%. I, I, my coming out of that, my question and was, is that healthy or not healthy? Ah, well that's a, com community health is an interesting living organism. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and there are lots of perspectives to it. There are some like really basic metrics, like how many contributors, how many deployments of your project, all those kinds of things. And those are things that historically we've looked at. Right. Um, I think when you start looking at community health from a broader perspective, um, are the are the the missions of these projects uh, are the is are the feedback mechanisms are in, are they in place and I and is there a social network of people working together to bring these projects and these keep these ecosystems healthy uh, is really the change and the other piece I mean I t we talk about the virtuous end users and we talk a lot about contributors and maintainers. Mm -hmm. I have. I am of a new opinion, or a, a loosely held belief, shall we say, <laughs> that we need to switch the dynamic a little bit to participants, right? Because code is essential, yep. to people. But there are everybody from the translators to the documentarians who are you know, doing this to the end users who are giving us feedback to the CI/CD, the people who are doing the build processes, all of the legal departments. All of those people are participants, and if you don't have a healthy engagement from all of those folks in your project, you don't have a healthy project. I, I want to ask you on that note, because we were talking earlier around how AI is coming in structurally, you got how things are organized, how the, the projects are organized, um, and the team dynamics. But if you look at projects and the, the power dynamics in open source, you see the common thread. You have entrepreneurs who want to create business models out of it. Mm -hmm. They do a project and they, try to be a red hat or try to be a support model. Everybody wants okay. to be a red hatter. So, yeah. <laughs> which by the way, we've confirmed that no one will, can do that yet. It's, a, it's never going to happen. You'll never see another red hat. But you'll see businesses come out of it. There are business models. So, let's say entrepreneurs, entrepreneurials with some investment back end thinking. Then you got companies, mm -hmm. like the big companies, which could be like a red hat, a Cisco, and then you got the lifts, contributors, well, let's call those corporations. And then public interest could be nonprofits and just general people. How do you look at those three pillars? Because the entrepreneurial side has been very active over the past decade and so, so that's been very key. Yep. Um, you're seeing a lot of entrepreneurial activity now with AI surge coming in, a lot of open source being donated on open foundation models and, and large language models. Mm -hmm. That's booming up. What's the, how do you view the act, like the core knobs? What are the core so one of the things, drivers of value? So when you see an entrepreneur or someone come out with a, a new project, um, you know, whether it's a small one like Micro Rocks inside the Postman community or you know, another, you know, something like that, it's really, I think, one of the things that almost everybody has drunk the Kool-Aid is that your project should be in a neutral repository. So a, a, things that are single vendor driven open source projects you, you look to them if you know if it's a trusted wonderful vendor or something like that then great but it, for entrepreneurs now what you're seeing i think is a lot of them looking to the foundations to be the the switzerland to offer them governance and legal and you know indemnification if something goes south you know <laughs> yeah, those kinds of things i think foundations play a, a big role they for get over the their skis basically they can't handle themselves yeah. they need help yeah they need help um, and it's it is hard you know to get brand recognition so in a way that's really the role that foundations play um, and that i think there there is a role though um, there's there's a, th a thing that's you know we talked a little i mentioned the the big tent effect that yeah. you know in OpenStack and stuff, and there's a, a sort of a tipping point too where uh, other foundations um, there, there's a I'm trying to be polite about this. Don't be polite. I'm not going to be too too, too polite. You there's a it. duplication of efforts. There's only there's a limited set of developer resources out there working on projects. So if you have an AI project in one foundation and or, or automotive or you know edge or whatever it is, and then the next foundation or the next group does another one, you're spreading those resources thin, you know, and so you're competing for those. So 
there's a, a level of competition between vendors trying to hire all the engineers, mm -hmm. but there's also a level of competition between foundations um, for um, members Recruit. and contributors. This is why this is why the health thing. I want to loop back to what you said about health because right. what we're seeing is that there's a lot of people who want to jump in to make money or mm -hmm. promote a project, yep. whatever their motivation is. It's putting a strain on it's putting a strain on the system. Yes. How do you know when something's rising and falling? Like legitimately, like when, ah. and, 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 and I bring this in two contexts. Some projects just deserve to die, right? Okay, they don't, they like, no traction, whatever, old, <laughs> not a lot of momentum. And then some that are, that should be doing better, but aren't. And, and, and so how do people figure out where they're, where they can jump in and help or nurture? This is an open question. Yeah. And we don't know the answer. Well, um, sometimes the data shows you. Okay, um, and it's a lot of it's the data plus the context. So you can analyze um, participation um, at the contributor maintainer, at the end user level, the deployments of projects, and, um, and to measure the, the, the health of an ecosystem. But you also have to really look at um, the connectivity of these projects to other projects in, in, in context. And I think that's really where you start to see true health um, if they're doing. So one mistake people often make is that a project will look like it's mature and static, but it may not need more than one or two maintainers. It may be just an essential small code base that we do it, or if you don't dive into it and have the context to understand it, it you know, all of its maintainers may yeah. have walked away and gone onto a sexier new open AI GPT there chat. There's a shiny thing. new toy dynamic. Oh, right. that's the that's the elephant in the room is like developers are just they're human, you know? We're we're human. We we like the the new toys and um, but I think if you it, you know, we talk all about AI and you know, edge stuff and all that but it all is reliant on this huge stack from the kernel to the containers to the cloud. All of those pieces m still need to be in play in order for the AI and the algorithms to run and the Jupyter Notebooks to launch and all of that goodness, so. And I, I think just building off of that and something you said earlier, I, I think it, it is a stack and there's dependencies up and down the stack. And I think, you know, again, two, you know, two times I've been on the Cube recently with CNCF and then here, I think one of the things that's striking is that there seems to be a lot of people bringing projects forward that overlap. Or There's a lot of overlap. And, and to I your point about competition, it, yeah. it, it's got to be hard. I, I mean, and, I, and I think it's, and some of it, um, it's up to the foundations that are accepting these projects yeah. to um, collaborate more, not to see each other as threats to it, you know, one, you know, land grabs for different projects, and to allow, you know, maybe an automotive, uh, it, you know, edgy thing to, to live in one foundation and be used with another, and to right. collaborate across ecosystems. Yeah. And there's not a, not a whole lot of that, yeah. you know. Yeah. I, I remember back, I actually ran a research group in the Global Grid Forum before mm -hmm. OpenStack, and uh, I actually brought somebody in from DMTF because we were doing stuff and I'm like, why are we reinventing the wheel here? And, yeah. and I think it's, it, it didn't happen, I mean, that's part of the reason I still believe they went away, was yeah. that they lost their major sponsor, but at the same time, it seems like that, like you said, the foundations looking at their stack, very, I, I would say, in, in a silo. Yeah, and it, it's interesting because in some ways, we absolutely need the foundations. Yep. We need them for governance, guidance, strategic visions and things along that line, and you know, they, they serve a huge purpose. But in some ways, they are also causing some fragmentation. Yeah. And um, the spread of projects, um, and the, the thi the, I'll keep saying, there are a limited number of developers with expertise, and the one thing you hear from, from vendors and enterprises is, we need more people trained on, whether it's Kubernetes or you know, something else. Right. We can't find them fast enough. And so, if you think about that in terms of the deployments at enterprises, um, that's a concern, but it's also a concern for these 
the code bases of these projects. We yeah. need to find the resources and to and continue to encourage and engage them. And to your point about that skill gap, we're also having a conversation around platforms yeah. versus tools. So you're seeing a platform war. Everybody wants to be a platform. Yeah. Where are those platform engineers? But then again, is it really a platform? Is it just an app that has systems thinking into it? Yeah. We were talking about this before yeah. we came on camera around dependencies that the holistic view is now the new normal. Yeah, I think uh, we need to apply more systems thinking to our ideas around ecosystems in the open source and, and all of the, our technologies. Because um, they, they cross industries now, they cross um, technologies, they cross you know, all kinds of barriers from you know, bare metal to hypervisors. There's just so many interlaced pieces to this that if we don't step back and reevaluate how we manage these ecosystems, there's, there's a lot of risks um, involved. Uh, and what's your advice right now for the folks watching? As we are at the front range now of the next generation of open source, which is maybe a step function higher than, I mean, we were riffing earlier with some other folks on theCUBE, us OGers, where we're doing, there was no open source. We had right. to steal software. Oh, I, and I did. <laughs> back in the day, and everyone we, and, will admit now, did. looking back. Yeah. <laughs> Statue of limitations has passed, yes. Rob, we can admit. <laughs> yeah, the cut and but paste no, world. It's been, a great, yeah. it's been a great run. We've won, it's an industry, the software industry is open source, right. period, full stop. Right. As we look at the next generation of talent coming in, opportunities in the landscape and the marketplace, what's your advice for how to lean into the ecosystem conversation? Yeah. How to, the mindset, the setup, the approach. So um, there's lots of ways to, to look at it. If you're looking at it from an enterprise that's trying to figure out your open source strategy, you know, how are you going to look at the, the, the bill of materials of the products you're delivering and analyze them so that they're, the, they're compliant, that you know what's actually embedded in there. That is like one of the oldest tasks I ever had. Yeah. Like uh, years ago I worked at Active State doing Python library packaging and analyzing all the licenses. That was like 15 years ago and we're back to having um, bill of materials, supply chain yeah. conversations. <laughs> it's, Really, one of the things you really need to know if you're an enterprise is what are you building with? What are your developers using? What libraries? What dependencies do they have? Um, so my first thing is know, your, know thyself, right? So really to look in deeply and gaze into what you're using, what your developers are using. Um, we at Betergia have lots of tools to do software developer analytics and dive into that and help you give a, a bird's eye view of where you're your, your in-house developers are actually contributing, and then maybe where um, you can find vendors that will help you to do that, um, to work on those projects as well. So there's that, that side of the house, which is an old side of the house, and I'm always shocked and surprised at how many people aren't doing yeah, it, right? Yeah. Um, and then there's the, the benevolent um, software vendors, and then the virtuous end users, and so trying to figure <laughs> out how we're going to get all of these people uh, to play. With. and virtuous in the same sentence, I yes. love that. Well <laughs> done. Yeah, well, well we had, we've had our run of uh, BDLs, <laughs> benevolent dictators for life, and there are still a few of them out there floating, and, and you know, some of them I'm incredibly grateful for, because they've done amazing things. Um, but I think the people that I'm most grateful for are these end users yeah. um, and the role that they're playing now because now they are contributing back into open source yeah. ecosystems yeah. and that just really changed the dynamic. Yeah, and I think the hyperscalers, um, like, like the big ones who had to build on their own because the general purpose, old proprietary market couldn't serve them, is the tell sign for how I see AI shaping out. You see, already see Meta just released, quote unquote, leaked. <laughs> the moat. They leaked their <laughs> kind of software, I think that was by design, but that just gave the open source community like a, a shot of adrenaline. Yep. It created a lot of vibe, and again, because it's shiny new toy, but it's relevant. Cool oh, absolutely. Relevant. So cool and relevant's a good equation. Well, I mean, I, I, I've been looking at uh, chat DPT and like documentation, you know? Creating good documentation for an open source project, or, you know, basic information. Those, those tasks, if we can automate some of that, yeah. you know, that's like would be amazing. Yeah. So applying some of that, um, those toolings. Yeah. Also I think the predictive analysis. So we have huge data lakes of um, developer participation in open source projects. If we can take that, tie it to predictive analysis and watch 
as I'm in Canada, I can say this, where the hockey puck is going, yep, where the puck is going to be. then we have a better sense of what our next dependencies are going to be, what the next risks are. And a lot of it is um, just risk analysis. Just like you would for a product, you should be doing risk analysis on your open source yeah. consumption. Yeah, I mean, it's an industry power down there, product market fit, there's, there's, you got to promote the project, you got to recruit a team, it's all the same kind of venture dynamics. Diane, great to have you on theCUBE, um, <laughs> and I know you're now at a new, you left Red Hat, you're at the new gate. Take a minute to explain what you're working on, what are you excited about? Well, I am incredibly grateful for the run that I had at Red Hat. My colleagues, I got to work with some of the best and brightest people, so big shout out to Red Hat, love you all. Um, I know I said I was retiring, but um, I couldn't get away from having the data lake and the information, and, and I love what you guys do, um, and I always wanted to be a research analyst. You know, I want to be the person that said, oh yeah, that's the next big thing. And in order to do that, I needed to have continued access to the data sets that I was mining to manage the open source community. Well, Stu went to Red Hat, you can come join the Cube. Oh well, let's Stu, see. Stu, you hear that? Hey Stu. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, no, 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 no. Uh, but, yeah, travel is not really my, my gig anymore. But I, um, oh, out there. I'm looking at um, booting up a research and advisory services that leverages the data that is in this Bittergia data lake. So if you're interested in finding out more, yeah. Give me a shout. Awesome, Diane, thank you for coming on theCUBE. Great insight, thanks for coming on. Okay, day one here at the Open Source Summit. I'm John Furrier. We'll be right back with more after this short break.